This week on the Backtable Podcast. For every, I guess, entrepreneur who's doing something that's completely new. So Anne Wojcicki, who you're probably familiar with, 23andMe, and has done a lot. So she, she invested in us uh, a while ago, and she's been an amazing partner. One of the things that I learned from her is this concept of weird to wonderful. Like at the beginning, when you're talking about something that's completely new, novel, de novo, like everybody like raises their eyebrows and it's like, it's weird. But at a certain point, like it passes that tipping point and then it's okay, it becomes ubiquitous. And then it's like, everyone's, ah, this is wonderful. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Backtable Urology podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Today, I'm honored to have a co-host with me, Dr. Eric Gantworker. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. We have a very special guest, Dr. Tamir Wolf, founder of Theater. Welcome, Tamir. Thanks. Dr. Wolf earned his MD. He's, he has both an MD and PhD. We'll get into that a little bit. What's unique about Tamir, uh, he did serve in the military. He, he served in the uh, Flotilla 13, which is the Naval Commando Unit equivalent to the U.S. Navy SEALs. He's a trauma surgeon. Extensive background, very cool physician entrepreneur. And so we wanted to have him come on and tell us a lot more about theater. So Tamir, let's jump into it. You know, tell us a bit about your training and your background as a trauma surgeon turned startup founder. First of all, Aaron, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And hi, Eric, as well. So yeah, quite a journey from the Navy into health tech. The idea is to ultimately have impact at a large scale. You know, being a physician you have impact on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I wanted something that's a bit more than that. And so for me, the move to health tech was pretty natural. Very cool. And, and so how long were you in practice for before you started in health tech? So most of my professional career as a physician was in the Navy when I was there for roughly eight years before I transitioned into health tech. And when you were in the Navy, how long were you serving this sort of commando unit and this next level kind of stuff. I, you're telling me there's a lot of things you can't tell us, which, which is totally understandable. <laughs> He'd have but, to kill you, Aaron. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. But, uh, you know, give our audience a little idea of like what your time was like in the military, maybe. So, um, yeah, throughout my entire Navy career, I was with the, the SEALs. A lot of it was in the front line. And actually some of my thoughts around theater stemmed from um, a bit of Naval experience. This is something I can talk about. It was a highly publicized, mainly because things didn't go as planned. In 2006, there was another war in Lebanon, and we were on this mission. We were supposed to target a terrorist cell that was firing rockets into Israel. Now, in Israel, everything is like, it's so close. You really do have a sense you're protecting home. Your family, your friends, everyone is like within a, a stone throw away from like all of this nasty stuff. So anyway, we were on this operation and things didn't go as planned. And, you know, suddenly I find myself under fire with 13 wounded and two that I had to operate on then and there. And so, you know, we did what we did. I think a lot of it more luck than anything else. And at the end of it, I, I remember thinking to myself, probably a lot of words that I can't say out loud right now, but ultimately like the gist of it was, Man, if I could have had like someone guiding me, coaching me throughout all of that experience, I probably could have done better because, you know, it's something that you never experience it until you experience it. And it's nothing like operating like under the neon in the OR, you know, with a ton of assistance, giving you everything and text and all of that and calm. And so I think that was like the first kernel for me thinking about, OK, decision support and guidance and assistance to, to surgeons to enhance performance and do better. So that was a bit of like what I encountered then. And, you know, over the years, I shifted into a position that allowed me to really take a look at things within the healthcare system as an insider, but also as an outsider because of my move into health tech. And that ability to have that type of dual vantage point allowed me to start thinking about, okay, you know, how do we leverage technology in order to provide support for surgeons in the OR? Yeah, I mean, that had to have been crazy stressful that eight-year period. Was the, the stress of it and the acuity of it, did that contribute to saying, you know what, I'm going to take a step back and to try and make a bigger impact? Or do you still kind of crave, you know, have that hunger for clinical care at all at this point? 
It's a great question. I think I needed a break. I need to step back a bit. And ultimately, when we go into medicine, it's like we're on a path. And that path is clear. Residency, fellowship, you know, then practicing surgeon, leadership, et cetera. Like the moment I, I took a step back, that opened so many doors for me. And I could think about like different paths in life and different trajectories. And so thinking about it, like ultimately I decided to go one path, but the ability to like push pause for a second and, you know, take a look at what's out there was something that I guess like happened for the first time after I stepped out of uniform. Yeah. Eric and I kind of talk about this a lot. We had, we had Chris Mancy on the show and he talked about stepping away from medicine and how it's a difficult decision, right? You're going out there and you're, you're putting it all on the line and not that you're not looking back, but it can be really, that can be stressful too, to step away from medicine, something that you're highly trained at and take that risk. But it sounds like it's, it's all worthwhile when we talk to guys like you and Chris that you're able to have a much bigger impact worldwide to, to taking this skill set further. Listen, it's a great point, but I can tell you, you know, on another note, I was a cancer patient last year and I can tell you that, you know, I want to have impact on billions of people, but you know, the surgeon that operated on me for eight hours and dissected lymph nodes off of my aorta, you know, he saved my life. So there's so much to say just for, you know, you know, the surgeons that are in the hospital grinding day in, day out for decades and have tremendous impact on, you know, specific individuals. So I think ultimately, you know, the world needs, you know, sort of a combination of, you know, folks who are like extremely driven to help on an individual basis. And then those who also take, you know, a different approach to it. Right. I want to ask you about that. If you're willing to talk a little bit more about that, a lot of people talk in this space about perspectives and we take different perspectives, the business perspective, the entrepreneur perspective, the medical perspective, but you had the unique opportunity to be in a space where you were the patient and you had already launched this company that was looking at surgeon performance. Did that change your experience or even change how you look at your company and what you guys are doing? Oh, for sure. I mean, it didn't change it. It just like reinforced everything, you know, specifically in this case, a lot of what we're talking about theater is enhancing transparency, introducing it into the OR, and also providing surgeons with tools that they've never had before to really understand what is being done in the OR, to analyze it, and then continuously improve. And it was so clear to me, being on, on that table, I was, I was, you know, knocked out. But like coming out of it, you know, you realize that you're knocked out for like eight hours. And the only thing that you have that really documents everything that you underwent there is an operative report. And we all know the shortcomings of operative reports as they are today, just because of the hectic nature of like our lives as physicians. And so we need to have better ground truth and we need to have a better understanding of what happens in, in the OR. And I mean, in surgery, you guys know this, there's like tremendous like understanding of outcomes, but there's very little understanding of process and what led to those outcomes. And the only way that we can do it is by routinely capturing and then analyzing and then addressing what actually goes on in the operating room. And so everything I went through really reinforced, you know, my thoughts. And like the, the other aspect of this is being a physician and a patient, I knew who to, like, I think within 10 minutes of like understanding like what I'm facing, I knew who to go to, where to go to, who has the most experience and who has the best outcomes. It took me like less than 10 minutes to get to that individual. But, you know, when you take a look at, you know, the average individual, they don't even know what the right questions are to ask as they, you know, try to navigate like a very, very difficult space. And especially like when you're sick and like there's so many like other aspects like emotional distress, et cetera, that you're dealing with. And so everything that we're talking about at theater is really to identify and understand what best practices look like so that we can level everyone up. And so that it doesn't matter, like this concept of where you live determines if you live is rendered like not true anymore. That really is at the core of everything that we're, that we're doing. And so my experiences as a physician like, just reinforced everything, the, the entire narrative, to be honest, that I previously had as a physician, entrepreneur. I'd really like to dig in on the transparency because I definitely see some pushback from surgeons about wanting to be transparent for a variety of reasons, and we're going to come back to that. But I also want to ask you sort of as you transitioned, and you came into this role, there's a lot of people, a lot of physicians who have ideas, but actually operationalizing those ideas, getting the technical skills to be able to come to fruition on those skills is a different thing. So how did you 
I establish skills in this area? How did you establish sort of the knowledge behind AI machine learning to be able to even start in this space coming from surgery? Listen, it's a great question. I think, you know, first of all, you need to be really passionate about something. And there's also, you know, what you're good at. So focus on that. And then it's basically talking to as many people as possible to understand how you complement your skill set. And then, you know, at some point in time, and like complementing your skill set, these could be like the business aspects of it, like the tech aspects of it. But it's all about, you know, your network and then finding the right people that can help you out. The other thing that I would say, and you probably saw this with Chris as well, is the fact that as a physician, if you want to get into this world at some point in time, especially if you want to lead it, you have to like just jump in, go all in. It's very difficult, I think, to like maintain your clinical practice and lead a company. But there are other things that you can do to like just get your feet wet. You can, you know, start advising a company, start interacting with high tech. You can take on a variety of like medical roles within companies and gather experiences and then identify what's the right thing for you. But I think, you know, first of all, like hopefully at the end of this, you can give out like my email and anyone who wants to dive into this world of entrepreneurship is definitely invited to contact me. Happy to pass it forward. Appreciate that. Tamir, I read a, an interview you did a couple of years ago where you were also kind of talking about the inspiration behind theater and you were talking about an experience that your wife had. And I think it was a coworker had both had the same procedure with different outcomes. Are you able to elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny. So, you know, this goes to, I'm a physician, but I actually dove into theater after witnessing variability from the patient angle. So not myself at that stage, but within a span of several months, we were living in New York at the time. And within the span of several months, I clinically diagnosed my wife and my previous boss, as it happens with appendicitis. And I took him to two different hospitals, seven miles apart in the city. At the same time, this was like the same timing? It's like a couple of months apart. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's like, you know, New York City, 2015, you know, you'd think, <laughs> but the, and it's like, it's appendicitis, you know, it's like bread and butter. Yeah. But the approach to treatment and treatment were very different, even though I already came with a clinical diagnosis and it was pretty clear cut. And so that impact of like different decision-making from the moment we stepped in the emergency room really led to different outcomes. And my boss, you know, went into septic shock and like really bad decision-making. Holy cow. Like nearly, you know, died a, a few times and protracted stay in the hospital. So something that he should have gone home like the next day, you know how it's like the snowball effect, like one complication leads to another and then you treat that. And then there are like complications that arise from treatment, et cetera. On the other hand, like with my wife, 12 hours from the moment we stepped in the emergency room until we we're back home, flawless experience. And it dawned on me that there is like so much variability in surgery today. There's like disparity in this field. And the more I dove into it, the more I realized that, you know, it's not a world thing. There are people around the world that don't have access to safe and affordable surgical care. But even in the United States, we have this problem where, you know, like I mentioned before, where you live determines if you live. There's an interesting article that came out in the Green Journal, so this is the gynecologist journal, I think towards like in August of last year, where interestingly enough, also in the New York area, but they took a look at women that had to undergo hysterectomy. And within a system that is high volume hysterectomy, they took a look at patients and like their socioeconomic status. And what they found was that more affluent patients go to the better surgeons who do things minimally invasively. And those who have less means are often referred to surgeons who have less experience and do things open. And I think that, you know, this is something that we cannot afford to have in this day and age. And so, you know, this, this aspect of variability, disparity is something that we can, we can leverage technology in order to tackle. And that's really at the core of theater. I want to ask a question about that because I've, I've been struggling with this idea for a very long time that surgeons need experience to get experience to improve performance. And, you know, this is where sort of the world of simulation has entered. But, you know, historically, you know, back at the turn of the century, there were county hospitals, right? And so they got a lot of experience hands-on in those county hospitals. And there was a economic gap between the patients that they were training on and the patients that they eventually did. And obviously the system has changed a little bit. But if you are, have an entire, let's move forward, and you have an entire society where people are only going to the surgeons that are the best at what they do. How do the other surgeons train to get to there? It's a great question. And like, and frankly, I think that 
you know, surgery hasn't changed in 400 years. It's still an apprenticeship model. And so a surgeon gathers experience in a specific location, right? Or one or two, if it's like residency and fellowship in like different places, with a very limited N of patients that they ultimately experience with specific demographic characteristics and specific, you know, there's a specific phenotype. And so the idea behind everything that we're doing at theater is you can think about this as like when we're talking about like decision support and the future of surgery is instead of having a single individual surgeon standing behind, behind your back as you're training and providing feedback at best verbal, at worst, you know, throwing a scalpel at you so you know that you sucked uh, that specific case. Well, maybe that's like 80s, 90s, but like it doesn't <laughs> yeah, happen today. Yeah. But the idea is to have not one surgeon provide that type of feedback, but to have, you know, the aggregated intelligence that stems from thousands of surgeons and tens of thousands of procedures as experience. That's, that I think is where we're headed to. And that's, you know, this issue that you raise is at the core of the problem that we have today. And that's what theater is about. Yeah. So can you tell us about how theater works today and where it's being applied? Yeah. So we partner with the most innovative hospitals to date that understand that one, they need to start capturing all of their, you know, procedures. It's interesting, like, you know, we're talking about AI and like decision support, but to your point, Eric, like one of the first issues that we tackled at theater was the fact that like most of what happens in the OR doesn't leave the OR. It's like what happens Correct. in Vegas stays in Vegas. Unless a patient records it on their cell phone by accident. Exactly. <laughs> by accident or not. Um, uh, yeah, it's, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, the fundamental or foundational capability that we developed is really to seamlessly record and capture each and every procedure that's done in the OR. And the focus initially is on minimally invasive procedures that today are performed under visual guidance. So this could be, you know, laparoscopic, robotic, et cetera. And the idea is to organize everything in a way that is structured, secure, compliant, et cetera, for a variety of use cases. That's really like the base layer of everything that we do. And so we're partnering with really like the most innovative hospitals in the country and around the world that understand that, you know, this is where the future is going to, that it does not make sense that we as patients or, or physicians have access to every chest x-ray, MRI or CT. And yet, you know, we have someone sedated for like eight hours and like, there's nothing after that. And based on this capability, we then like start providing the next layers of value. So first of all, you know, if you don't capture, you can't measure. And if you don't measure, you can't improve. So like the first layer is capturing and organizing. The second layer is, all right, let's automate analysis of what is being done in a procedure. And the third, let's provide insights based off of that. And so those are like the, the key components of what theater, theater provides today. And those insights can be clinical in nature. They can be operational like improving throughput. We can talk about this, improving throughput in a given operating room, et cetera. But the idea is that maybe I should have said this at the onset, like the way that folks traditionally think about intraoperative video is fundamentally different from, I think, where the future or where we're going in the future. So like the traditional way of looking at it is, yeah, let's take a look at it and review it and present it at a conference and let's fast forward or move forward. But video is like unstructured data that if you structure it, it would be amazing. So what we're doing is identifying key steps of procedure, key events, key safety milestones, et cetera, ultimately decisions that are being made, and we're starting to codify it so that down the road, we'll be able to start providing surgeons with augmented capabilities of decision-making, which I think is crucial. So hopefully that makes sense and put things a bit into like structure of what we're doing. Yeah, it sounds like it could be significantly helpful in like helping you prepare for a procedure, whether it's something that you've determined that you have issues with, you know, a certain part of that procedure and you want to go back and look, would an individual preparing for a surgery be able to access data? It sounds like they can access data from around the world, all data you have and see and compare your outcomes at that or your, your issues with that particular part of the procedure and compare that to the rest of the world. Does that sound right? Yes, but I think most individuals are like, so surgeons are very competitive and I think like their main competition is within their institution. Yeah. And so I think like benchmarking within a department is something, but I think that for a physician, like th there are multiple use cases, whether it's preparing or debriefing after or taking a look at 
procedures at an aggregate level. So like some of the use cases that we have right now, like, you know, there's a hospital system that I'm talking to that we're going to start working uh, hopefully this year with. They have significantly more leaks after colon surgery compared to the national average based on Nisquip. So they know that that's an issue, but they do not know why. And the only way that you can understand why is really to dive into the process and analyze these procedures. And so, you know, that's an example of how like an aggregate of data and information and then diving into like specific procedures can help us really identify the root cause of issues. And there are a lot of other things that we're doing with this, but I think the key like innovation here is in the fact that a video is more than just like, let's, you know, review, go back, go forward. It really is about all the information that's embedded within. Mm -hmm. We obviously see the value of this. And in a second, I'd really like, I think we both really want to dive into a little bit about the AI machine learning to be able to tag the videos, I think, which is the really important step here. But I want to talk about that transparency that we alluded to before and the idea that when you come to a surgeon and say, hey, you have higher leaks and it's because you're doing this technique. And also the other implications of wanting to record everybody's surgery with the intent that it's going to be reviewed by some other body, whether it be inside their institution or out, but also the implications on the medical legal side and just some doctors don't want to be recorded. So I really wanted to address that now. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. So let's start with the fact that like surgeons record their procedures today. It's sporadic, it's not organized, but they do it today. So, you know, the delta is not whether or not to record, but whether or not to do it routinely. So I think that's like one aspect of this that I'd like to mention. And listen, there's always fear of the unknown, like something new, and especially in healthcare, like adoption is relatively slow. But I think we're at a tipping point, and this is something that's way beyond theater. It's like, as a specialty, you see surgeon leaders that put out op-eds the title of which is, you know, for example, a video is worth a thousand operative reports or professional societies like SAGES and minimally invasive general surgery that are starting to think, all right, how do we certify folks based on assessing their capabilities in video? It's called VBA or video-based assessment. Or you take a look at the American Board of Surgery that's also assessing entry and re-entry criteria based on video. Because the bottom line is ultimately taking a look at the video, that's the ground truth. That is like reality. And if you could tap into that and assess, then that provides a lot of value. And I think the way that the American Board of Surgery, for example, is thinking about it is like their entire mandate is to make sure that you, Eric, you, Aaron, and I, Tamir, as possible patients, get the best care possible from, you know, the best surgeons. And, you know, that's their entire mandate. What are the tools that they have today to ensure that a written exam? So I think, you know, the, the world is heading in that direction. And so I think there is a tipping point, whether it's like surgeons or professional societies that are going to take us there. I think, again, there's a natural fear. I also think that no surgeon goes into the operating room saying today, you know, I'm going to do something bad, right? Like the intent is to help. And, you know, there's the prime directive of uh, so like, you know, no one goes into, into a procedure thinking that something will happen, but sometimes things do happen. And I think like transparency has never been bad in any industry that you look at. And I think it's the way things will be. And then, you know, the decision is, all right, do we want to be on the forefront of this? And do we want to be the ones that help define how this looks like? Or do we want to be dragged in by lawmakers, et cetera, et cetera? And I think that, you know, sometimes, you know, especially when we're talking about AI, Folks look at this as like a black box. We have no idea what's going on inside. And I think the approach that we've taken at theater is really to involve our surgeon partners from the start. This is why I think surgeons need to be a part of the process from the start. So there's never apprehension about like, where's the data from? And, you know, is it something that's reliable? It's your data. It's your information. And now we're just like building and building value on top of that. But you know where it comes from. So hopefully this answered like some aspects of your question. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to, again, you know, on the show, we've talked a lot about AI. We've talked to a bunch of different folks who are using machine learning for various use cases. But I think, you know, besides fields like radiology and dermatology that are fearing AI take over their jobs, which we've pretty much debunked, surgeons may have an education we call it external locus of causality. And it means when they get feedback, they feel like it's somebody else's problem and not theirs. And they may say, oh, the algorithm is wrong. And I'm not going to change what I do because I've been doing this for 20 years. 
And so I think your issue with AI is going to be slightly different than sort of the dermatology and radiology field. And so how are you addressing those? You touched on a little bit by involving surgeons, but not every surgeon is going to be involved in that process. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, it's all a matter of N. So we need to have, you know, significant data. I think one of the amazing things that we can do as we leverage technology is to gather significant amounts of data that also like minimize bias that's inherent in, in healthcare and in surgery. I think in particular, the ability to gather information from a significant number of surgeons and many different centers and link, again, what is happening in the operating room with outcomes will then allow us to understand, okay, what does best practices really look like? Because it's not best practices because it comes out of like center X or, or Y. It's best practices because we analyze what's happening in the operating room and then we link it to the patient that goes into surgery and outcomes. And that's why something can be defined as best practices. And I think, you know, once you're able to show that type of approach and connect the dots along the patient journey, then surgeons who are extremely data-driven by nature will start believing. Correct. It's hard to argue with objective data. Exactly. Right. So I think I totally agree with you. So which specialties, Tamir, are you guys starting with and sort of, I know you've been talking to some urologists, gynecologists, definitely the specialties that use video and endoscopy, but can you share with our audience uh, which specialties you guys are starting with and kind of moving towards? Yeah. So basically anything that is minimally invasive, whether straight stick or robotic, is really a field that, and fields and procedures that we can help with. We did start with minimally invasive general surgery, including colorectal and bariatric, urology, and gynecology. And those are the areas where we really dive deep and provide very interesting analytics based off of all the key moments that we're able to automatically identify in procedures. Obviously, you know, there are many more specialties and we're, we're starting to, to move into additional directions like thoracic, and others, the core principle of, you know, let's start gathering what is being done in the operating room. I mean, that's agnostic to specialty. We can do that. And we are doing that with any and all specialties that today have a visual component to it. And here I want to mention like the theater, like we're predominantly a software company. And so we're not adding sensors or cameras or anything. We rely on the hardware stack that's already in your operating rooms. And we're pretty much agnostic to the system. So whatever you already have, we can work with and provide significant value on top of uh, what you're doing today. Yeah. Yeah. How about ENT? I'm just curious because for Eric <laughs> and my wife. We do some in this topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a bit of like transphenoidal work. Yeah. That's done in ENT. Those JNAs. We're a small specialty. Everybody forgets about us. We're only about 10,000, so. <laughs> right. Well, I'm thinking about applications for IR because, you know, the problem with us is, yeah, we might have a recording, but it's all fluoroscopy. So it's radiation. So it's not like I can fluoro a whole case. So it's, it's here and there, little bits of information. Any idea about like how, because that's going to be with all your endovascular specialties, right? It's going to be vascular surgery, cardiology, IR. Any ideas on how theater can be applied without that sort of video information or data? Yeah, so our like tech uh, capabilities are also really very much transferable between medium. But I have to say that uh, like focus is key when you're building a company. And so like our initial focus is on soft tissue procedures. You know, down the road, as we continue to build and expand the capabilities of the company, we'll dive into more and more specialties. Very cool. My next question is, What's been the hardest lesson learned, you know, building a new tech company? And do you have any like fierce competition out there? Because you guys, I mean, the AI space, there's a lot of competition in terms of, like Eric was saying, radiology, dermatology, pathology, those sort of pattern recognition AI companies. But in this, this is different. This is surgical intelligence. Do you guys have competition in this space? Yeah, there, there's always competition. I think competition is good because it solidifies the need, which is like the most important thing, I think you know, lessons, et cetera. Listen, it, a part of it is competition. I think like every day is a roller coaster when you're building a company. You've probably heard this. And I think the hardest lesson for me, <laughs> to be honest, is about patients. You guys know this, you know, like you're an interventionalist and like surgeons, like, you know, we need to get stuff done. And I think that like, I never feel that we move fast enough and we are like the underdog still. I think we're, we are the David in this scenario. So for, for us as a company, speed alongside creativity and responsiveness, these are like really our main assets. 
so that our customers don't only love our product, but love us as a company. And I think as long as we maintain that type of mentality, that'll help us win. That alongside focus, which I mentioned earlier on. Yeah. The, the other piece of patience is getting people to understand your vision and like realize it and feel it the way you do, right? Because you can talk clearly the passions there, but it's hard sometimes. Like I get frustrated, like getting people to understand what it is that I, where I see back table going or something else. That to me is also a big challenge, you know, is like translating that passion, that vision that you have for theater. But that's the case for like for every, I guess, entrepreneur who's doing something that's completely new. So Anne Wojcicki, who you're probably familiar with, 23andMe and has done a lot. So she, she invested in us uh, a while ago and she's been an amazing partner. One of the things that I learned from her is this concept of weird to wonderful. Like at the beginning, when you're talking about something that's completely new, novel, de novo, like everybody like raises their eyebrows and it's like, it's weird. But at a certain point, like it passes that tipping point and then it's okay, it becomes ubiquitous. And then it's like, everyone's, ah, this is wonderful. Yeah. Like as if it always existed. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like if, like, if like how, like, there's no way we could have like been doing things without this. And I think like, you know, again, I, I mentioned the tipping point. I think like the next year or two are the tipping point. So, you know, you're familiar with companies in the radiology space. I think, you know, go back to 2018. We're 17 where, you know, AI and radiology was like a relatively new concept. Like fast forward to today, I don't think there's a hospital that is not, you know, using or considering utilizing algorithmic capabilities to help in workflow in radiology. Well, I, I think we're in the like 2017, 2018 phase of routine video capture and analysis in the world of surgery. And fast forward a few years from now and not many it will be in that wonderful stage where like, you know, of course we do this. One question about one specific, you know, with this technology, obviously you've heard of OR Black Box and obviously they're a little bit more hardware based than you are, but can you, for our audience, sort of differentiate yourselves from sort of what OR Black Box is doing and Trauma Black Box versus what theater's doing? All right. So first of all, it's interesting, like the black box is never black, it's orange. And, and yeah, it's orange and white, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's orange. So that we actually, we actually have it at our hospital. So that's why I've, I, I've seen it. Yeah. I think the key difference is in what we are analyzing. So black box really takes a look at like team dynamics and like the team interactions, et cetera. Whereas we're like singularly focused on intracorporeal surgical footage, analysis of video and connecting it or marrying it to the EMR data. I think the folks who started Black Box were very innovative. I think there are challenges when introducing hardware into the surgical ecosystem and environment and when you're trying to capture like everything in the operating room. So we strategically went at things from a different perspective of let's focus on what's already being done. Let's minimize friction with anyone within the OR, nurses, et cetera, and let's become the best at this focused aspect that we can analyze. And from there, you know, you never know how you grow. And I think there's tremendous validity and value to assessing other things in the operating room. But I think you have to be like very focused and in a field that is already hesitant to adopt technology that increases transparency, start with what, in our opinion, like makes more sense and is easier to scale, which is intracorporeal. Absolutely. Speaking of growth and size, can you give our audience a, an idea of like where you guys are today and what's your projected growth in terms of your roadmap? Have you been sort of following a certain growth trajectory and are you, do you feel like you're ahead of schedule or, or kind of falling behind? Yeah, well, we're moving full speed ahead. We started out like our R&D is in Israel. And we started out with a local sandbox there. We're slowly capturing like the entire Israeli market, but it's not a huge market as you can imagine. And our focus is really on uh, North America. And so we're working with leading uh, centers, both in uh, Canada, like McGill, and in the United States, namely, you know, one of the key customers that we started out with, our Mayo Clinic in Rochester. We have amazing partners there in all of the specialties that I mentioned, um, also like at an enterprise level. And so we're making a lot of headway there and we're continuously building and growing and expanding and adding additional hospitals in the United States, which is really our, our key focus. But like I mentioned before, we never move fast enough, so we need to move faster. Yeah. I want to ask a little bit about, you know, everybody sort of imagines that they have an idea and they're going to start a company tomorrow and then it scales to a multi-billion dollar business. But we all know that there's falters along the way. So I'd like to ask some of the specifically AI and machine learning lessons that you learned the hard way 
also scaling and getting into institutions and getting acceptance at the institution level? Yeah, so everything that we've done from the start has been with the intent of scaling, especially when we're talking about algorithmic capabilities. And so some of the work that we've done is actually published in Nature and, and other journals talking about concepts of transfer learning and generalization of algorithms in what we're doing. We're doing something that I think is like, it's very unique. It's not like your regular AI that you talk about, like in radiology or pathology, which is like diagnostic. This is different. A lot of what we're doing is action recognition. And because of that, when we analyze, let's say, a gallbladder, it doesn't inform us only on gallbladders, but the way we've built it is it informs us on sleep gastrectomies, it informs us on hysterectomies, it informs us on pretty much each and every other soft tissue procedure that we're analyzing. And, you know, that's the approach that we took so that we have the biggest bang for our buck you know, if you will, for when we analyze a specific procedure. And that also goes into like scalability because today we receive hundreds and thousands of procedures on a daily basis. And each one of those is returned, analyzed to the, to the surgeon, even before they scrub out of the operating room. And you can only do that if you have a very scalable way of analyzing these procedures, which sometimes are like hours and hours long. And so that's really from that angle. You know, I think there are like very interesting, and this might be agnostic to like, if it's a AI company or another company, I think to scale and to be successful, there are so many pitfalls along the way, but I think like the key thing is cultural, to be honest. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we've done at theater, and this is uh, like between Dotan, my co-founder and myself, like so aligned on it from like before like day minus one around culture, is, you know, the type of company that we want to build. So like for us, for example, the way we're approaching it is, I don't know if you're familiar with a book uh, about Netflix culture called No Rules Rules. So that's really, you know, our approach, which basically talks about find the best individuals that you can, the most talented people that are super dedicated professionals and that just have like common sense. And then you bring them on board, you trust them and you let them run. No rules, no policies. And that's how you move fast. You know, you keep focus and ultimately win. It's all about the people. Yeah. No micromanaging, no we work craziness or nah. Uber craziness. Nah, <laughs> we are super pumped, but not in that way. No. <laughs> <Right>. yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Man. Yes. Yeah. Company culture is so essential, just key, you know. But how do you know in this remote setting, it sounds like you guys are kind of you're all over the place, you're all over the world. How do you keep that company culture, I, you know, you're letting people do their own thing, but also how do you keep the cohesiveness, right? Where everybody's still feels like they're part of the team. Yeah. So I think we have two main sites, one in Tel Aviv and the other in Palo Alto, and then, you know, two hubs and a lot is around that. A lot is here. We've worked like this from the get-go, from the start. Dotan started in Tel Aviv and I was in New York at the time when we founded the company. And so, and I think today it's easier, like everything's on Zoom, et cetera. But yeah, I agree. Being there in person, you know, feeling the culture is extremely important. But ultimately, everything is easier if, if your selection process of individuals, as you onboard them into the company, is like I mentioned before, and you basically filter individuals based on, you know, whether they are people that have common sense and, you know, you let them run and you trust them. That that's really is, you know, it, it's all filtered like at the get-go. If you bring on board like the wrong type of people, then you waste time on, you know, management aspects. But if you bring the right people on board, it's a lot easier. Yeah. And turnover is super costly, right? Turnover is super costly. I have to tell you, our first employee, November 1, 2018, we have not had a single employee, full-time employee leave us since we started. And with a significant portion of our employees in Tel Aviv, um, which is like Startup Central, I think that speaks volumes to the type of individuals that we bring and to the fact that they're all like so connected to the mission of the company. And so that's something I'm, I'm really, really proud of. That's amazing. Man. So awesome. Well, I was going to start wrapping things up. We're getting close to the hour. Eric, did you have any more questions? No, I mean, you, you've given a, a bunch of advice along the way. And I think great pearls for anybody who's wanting to get involved. Is there any other advice that you would give for a physician or healthcare professional that's listening to this and says, hey, I'd really like to do something like this or get involved with a company that's doing innovative and interesting things? 
first of all, feel free again to like, you know, just uh, shoot me an email. I think, you know, don't be afraid, you know, doing something different and like even like thinking about doing something that's not like clinical in nature, you know, might be daunting. But I think there is tremendous need for the clinical know-how, knowledge and expertise that, you know, physicians, whether like, you know, internist or interventional or surgeons have. And I think that industry has huge power to push things forward, but they can't do anything without the clinical understanding, know-how and, and partners. And so I just urge anyone who's interested in like diving into this to dive into it. Yeah. Solid advice, Tamir. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. And um, are you, did I hear correctly? Are you going to be at AUA here in a couple of weeks? Yes, we in will Orleans. be at AUA. Yes. Right, so man. any urologist who wants to, you know, change surgery, come and talk to us. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, look forward to hanging out in New Orleans when I see you there. Perfect. Looking forward. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Eric. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Vidavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Deng. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.